readings again, everybody. We will consider a syndrome here called Pussyager syndrome. This is a genetic disorder, uh, as you probably uh, know, based on uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, so this is rare. It's uh, not as common as the USMLE would have you uh, think, but uh, it is an autosomal dominant disorder that's characterized by a constellation of uh, pigmented macules, usually uh, on the, uh, the lips or in the mouth, and uh, also polyps in the GI tract, but they can also occur elsewhere. Uh, they can occur uh, in the bladder. Um, and these are hamartomatous polyps in contrast to uh, adenomatous polyps that we see in other, uh, some other disorders. They tend to manifest very early on, usually uh, around 9, 10, 11 years of age, uh, late in the first decade or early in the second decade of life. Uh, but it can uh, manifest earlier or later. Uh, there's an increased lifetime risk of cancer, and that's going to be really central to the management of this disorder. Um, surveillance is going to be uh, what we're primarily focused on in dealing with these patients. And it's considered under the GI polyposis syndromes, uh, which also includes other uh, disorders that cause GI polyps, uh, which we will consider in our differential. So up to 94% of patients with Pitzjägers have a mutation uh, of a serine threonine kinase uh, gene, STK11, which is on the short arm of chromosome 19, and this is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, now, uh, about 50% of patients will have an affected family member, and what that tells you is that 50% of patients then are going to be uh, spontaneous mutation. So that's a relatively high rate of spontaneous mutation. Uh, if it does run in the family, it should be an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And like I said, this is pretty rare, uh, 1 in 60 to 120,000. Now, the cancer risk is uh, not just in the GI tract, which, of course, is an important part of, uh, of where the cancer uh, can come up. Uh, we think of the colon and the small bowel. Uh, but there is an increased risk of cancer elsewhere as well, even though we don't necessarily see symptoms in those uh, areas until uh, cancer has developed. Uh, so remember that the STK is, uh, is a tumor suppressor gene, and so it makes sense that if you have a mutation, you're going to have uh, an increased risk of cancer overall. So the most common cancer that we see in patients with Pitzjäger syndrome is breast. Uh, it's 54%, and that's uh, probably uh, primarily in women. Uh, but uh, that just has to do with the fact that breast cancer is a common cancer to get in general. Uh, now, if you look at the risk ratio here, patients with Pitzjäger syndrome are at increased risk relative to the general population uh, of small bowel cancer, stomach cancer, uh, colon cancer, and pancreas cancer. Uh, so those are where the, the uh, that's what the STK11 gene is going to primarily affect, if that makes sense. Uh, but the frequency of cancer, uh, when we're talking about breast, colon, pancreas, stomach cancer being more common, that has to do more with the fact that those are just more susceptible organs uh, to cancer. Uh, so... Important to remember that uh, when, you're, when you have a patient with Pitzjäger syndrome, particularly a female, uh, that uh, breast uh, surveillance is, is being done, and then also uh, keeping in mind the colon and the pancreas and the stomach. So we'll talk about that more when we get on to management. What are the features that we see? Of course, those dark brown, dark blue pigmented macules are going to be seen. Uh, primarily on the lips and buccal mucosa, but you can also see them on the hands and feet. You can also see them in the perineum as well. Uh, they tend to fade during adolescence, uh, so when you see adults, you're not going to see these as prominently as when you see them in children, uh, but the buccal lesions in the mouth will typically remain. Uh, on the GI tract, you will see hamartomatous polyps. Typically, these won't be recognized, though, until they manifest. And uh, when they manifest, uh, typically it's going to be GI bleeding, which can result in melanin or hematochesia. The polyps can also prolapse outside, uh, into the, or outside of the rectum, if that's uh, where you have um, polyps. Uh, you can also get into susception, as these can be... Uh, 
these can be a focus for uh, for the for the bowel to uh, to telescope uh, into itself, and then it, they can also cause obstruction as well. Uh, so usually you won't recognize GI symptoms until you get bleeding or obstruction or intussusception. Uh, they're primarily found in the small bowel, uh, but they can also occur in the large bowel as well, as well as the stomach, nasopharynx, and bladder. Typically, uh, they will become diffuse, hundreds to thousands, and this stands in contrast to juvenile polyposis syndrome, where usually you have uh, quite a few less. Uh, the jejunum is the most common place in the small bowel. So this is uh, the mucocutaneous lesions uh, that you see in uh, Pitsieger syndrome. Uh, so notice uh, that uh, this child has freckles, uh, but uh, and that's probably a manifestation of the Pitsieger syndrome, but uh, definitely these, these bluish uh, macules that you see on the lips are very characteristic. Let's see it again here. Um, so in this patient, you can see the macules uh, on the hands and feet. This is a hamartoma. You wouldn't know that, though, uh, until you biopsy it. Um, this is in the jejunum. So here are some polyps in the stomach. And then here you can see that this patient had quite extensive polyposis uh, in the right colon here, uh, transverse colon. Up on the top right, uh, in the sigmoid, and then also in the rectum. Physical development will be normal. Uh, however, in cases of undetected bleeding, if it's slow, uh, you can develop an iron deficiency anemia, but this is pretty rare. Uh, usually when bleeding occurs, it's going to be uh, apparent. The approach to the patient is based on the presenting symptoms. So if you have a, a uh, and like I said, unless uh, the patient as, um, you know, unless the patient comes in and you're getting routine checks, uh, well child checks, and you see the uh, very obvious lesions, or uh, you have a child of an affected family and the parent knows to get the child in uh, once, they, once they start developing uh, those buccal lesions, uh, then uh, usually these children will not present until they have symptoms. And those symptoms will be GI. So in cases of suspected bowel obstruction, then the best initial test is going to be an abdominal x-ray. Note that we're just working these patients up based on how they present. Uh, in cases of suspected intussusception, which you have vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, current jelly stool, palpable sausage-like abdominal mass in classic cases, the best initial test is going to be abdominal sonography, uh, where you'd see the target sign, and then a therapeutic enema. You could also start with the therapeutic enema. It really just depends on how you want to approach uh, the patient if they have a very obvious intussusception case. But usually abdominal sonography is something that's readily available and quick to do uh, while you're getting the patient ready for treatment. Uh, in cases of suspected gastric outlet syndrome, uh, such as projectile vomiting, uh, the best initial test would be abdominal sonography. Uh, in cases of melena, then you're going to get an upper and lower endoscopy. In cases of hematochesia, you can go ahead and get a uh, lower endoscopy. As always, the history is important. So patients with chronic on and off colicky abdominal pain, uh, that's consistent with small bowel polyps, uh, but not specific. Uh, when entertaining the diagnosis of Putzieger syndrome, uh, family history is always going to be valuable, especially asking around for uh, family history of cancer, so breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. Uh, you want to know in which family members those are present, and you can make a pedi pedigree and look for an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Uh, but definitely remember to keep in mind, since Half of these cases are sporadic, that a family history consistent with Putzjager syndrome not having that does not rule out the diagnosis. Your workup uh, initially is going to be to get a CBC, uh, get iron studies, look at the stool for occult blood, and then a pan endoscopy. Uh, you should remove any polyps greater than one and a half centimeters in diameter, and you should remove uh, any other polyps uh, if can't find any other ones, uh, 
uh, that are large enough, you should remove whatever polyps you can find uh, to biopsy them. Uh, we're looking for hamartomatous histology. If we see that, that's going to be part of our clinical criteria for diagnosis. You'll get an upper endoscopy, a lower endoscopy, and then you should do some form of small bowel visualization. Uh, Push-pull enteroscopy can be useful if you don't see any polyps on EGD or colonoscopy because remember that the small bowel is the most common place for these to manifest. Uh, however, if you get polyps on uh, either EGD or colonoscopy, then you can do just a cap capsule enteroscopy, a little bit easier than doing the push-pull enteroscopy. Uh, the, the advantage to doing the push-pull enteroscopy is that you're able to get through the small bowel and do biopsy, whereas if you do the capsule endoscopy, uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, you're not going to be able to do that. Clinical criteria for diagnosis includes getting uh, documentation of histologically proven hamartomatous polyps and then documenting at least two of the following, which is pretty easy uh, to do, either a family history of autosomal dominant pattern, uh, which can be cancer history, it can be documented Pitzjäger syndrome, hamartomatous polyps, anything that shows an autosomal dominant pattern suspicious for Pitzjäger syndrome. Uh, the mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation, which is pretty easy to detect on clinical examination, uh, and then the presence of polyps in the small bowel. Uh, so I should just mention you need only two of these three. The differential diagnosis, as alluded to earlier, juvenile polyposis syndrome also has hamartomas in the small bowel. Um, you can also see them in the large bowel as well. Uh, you can get associated complications. Uh, but one of the most salient features of uh, Pritz-Jäger syndrome is the pigmentation abnormalities. We don't see that in juvenile polyposis syndrome. Uh, also, the hamartomas tend to be less extensive. Familial adenomatous polyposis also has polyps, but they're only found in the large bowel. And then, importantly, these are adenomas, not hamartomas. Uh, this is due to a loss of APC, which is found on the long arm of chromosome 5. Uh, there are a couple syndromes that are associated with FAP. So Gardner syndrome is FAP plus osteomas. Typically, these occur in the mandible. And then Turcotte syndrome is FAP uh, associated with medulloblastoma. Cronkite Canada syndrome is very rare in the U.S. since two-thirds of patients are of Japanese descent. Uh, in this case, you have hamartomas of the GI tract but there will also be dermatologic symptoms, including nail atrophy and alopecia. And then finally, Cowden syndrome also has hamartomas, but there's additional symptoms, including skin tumors, uh, such as trichloromomas, uh, and then possibly neurologic symptoms. Uh, this is due to a benign tumor of the cerebellum uh, called a cerebellar gangliocytoma, and I can't remember what the name of the syndrome is. I think it's called Lermet syndrome. Uh, where you get these uh, movements, uh, ataxia and things like that, uh, which we would expect with the cerebellum. The management of Pitzjäger syndrome is primarily symptomatic and surveillant, so we will refer these patients certainly to GI and then as necessary to urology, OBGYN. Um, GI surveillance is going to be uh, is going to be very important. So starting in childhood or on, at the onset of symptoms, whichever is earlier, uh, you'll start uh, with an annual hemoglobin every year, and this is going to be done for life, as well as an upper endoscopy every year. Uh, then starting in the late teens or onset of symptoms, whichever is earlier, usually in the late teens though. Uh, Colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy can be done every two to three years. Um, if you do a flexible sigmoidoscopy, though, rather than a colonoscopy, you'll also need to do a barium enema. And then with the pancreas, starting at 25 years of age, you'll do an ab abdominal sonography uh, or uh, a, a, an endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, if you do the abdominal sonography, it's recommended that you do that every year. If you do an endoscopic ultrasound, you should do that every two years. Now with these GI uh, methods, uh, there's really no, uh, there's no recommended specific age to start. So these are just general recommendations um, and it'll be up to the uh, gastroenterologist.
Uh, for the breast, uh, you'll do a mammography every two years, starting at 18 years of age, and then starting at 40 to 50 years of age, you'll start to do it every year as recommended. And then with the genital urinary system, uh, for males, you'll do a testicular exam every year. For females, it's a little more extensive. You'll do a pelvic exam, sonography, and pap smear every year, starting at 18 years of age. And some physicians will recommend doing an endometrial biopsy as well. And that's obviously because of the risk of uterine cancer. Now, some will also recommend screening with tumor markers. Uh, so you can get uh, the ones that you get would be CEA, which uh, screens for colon cancer, uh, CA199, which screens for pancreatic cancer, and CA125, uh, which screens for ovarian cancer. Long-term regular follow-up, of course, is going to be of the utmost importance since surveillance is necessary to detect many cancers that are usually terminal, particularly pancreatic cancer, by the time symptoms of the cancer itself present. Uh, the survival is approximately 50% by age 57 years, so uh, that's significant. And, and the reason, obviously, is cancer. Um, so that just highlights the importance of uh, regular surveillance. And then genetic counseling should be offered. Uh, these patients are fertile, but as with any autosomal dominant disorder, there's a 50% chance of passing the allele on to the offspring, and patients should be aware of this. If you have any questions, write me a comment below.